okay so for week 11 of summer anime we're almost there we're almost finished a lot of like cool shows about to reach the finales we didn't get too many finales this week but it was like pretty jam-packed anyway also some anime news before we continue cyberpunk edge runners dropped this week so it's kind of like a netflix drop 10 episodes it's not really a seasonal anime, but I checked it out. It was pretty good. It was a good binge. And I could give it a lot of praise. I'm not going to spoil any of it, but basically it's like a good story about the cyberpunk world. They're using like some of the more familiar characters in the game, but it's also like its own new story. It's done by Traeger, who are like amazing at making wild shit <laughs> and then yeah, animating it. So yeah, a lot of good music, a lot of like cool story. And it just follows a dude and his life and path of becoming a cyberpunk, becoming an edge runner. So it's a lot of like emotional moments, a lot of like fights scenes cool action the story isn't too unique like you know it's pretty predictable a lot of like common tropes but it's still good that doesn't make it bad a big theme in this show is basically being poor sucks it doesn't matter if you're in the real world if you're in the cyberpunk world uh being poor is suffering also in more anime news isekai oji san yo the funniest anime we had this season it got canceled or postponed actually there's some like netflix delays of some like issue with the production company but damn i miss it because this is legitimately the funniest show we had this season hopefully you come back soon maybe towards the winter season but yeah let's get into the anime review also i'll talk about overlord starting off overlord season 4 episode 11 i haven't really talked about this anime too much in the review just because a lot of the beginning episodes were kind of just filler like we just met some races eins was doing things it was like very skippable the like current four episodes we have though, uh shit's like escalating. That's all I could say, because there's like this whole conflict, and then he basically threatened to go to war with the kingdom and kill everyone, just full on genocide. So that's pretty much the scene we have right now in this last four episodes. People are like really stressed in the kingdom. It's like, okay, we're gonna prepare to die, like Ainz is the strongest dude ever. There's nothing we could do. Or is there? So we see a lot of people in this episode kind of planning things. So I'm not too familiar with all their names. So yeah, please forgive me. But yeah, I think Coco Doll, we see him like being rescued. So a lot of the leaders, they're like shipping people off to Ainz's village because he made this like survivor village. So basically, if anyone wants to evacuate, if you don't want to get genocided, just um, you could live here in peace. So he's kind of like doing a good thing, I guess. So, uh, I mean, it, it begs the question, is he actually going to kill all these innocent people in general? Like, I know a lot of people in the kingdom are evil, but yeah. So we see Shaltair kind of, like, managing things over there. But yeah, after that, there's, like, a big-ass fight scene. Uh, probably, like, the biggest fight scene we had in this season. And they were building up to it, so I don't think anything else would kind of deliver on this. So basically, Ainz, he fights this dude who has, like, this big armor and just, like, magic weapons, while Albedo is fighting the Mecha Gundam red dude with the gun. So, yeah, Albedo's really strong, you know? She has her, like, battle armor, her wings flying around. This red Gundam dude, he can keep up with her a little bit. Like, he can kind of be a decoy, bait her, and not get killed. <laughs> but overall, yeah, he can't beat her. And now Ainz is fighting this big armor dude. He says his name is Riku, but he's actually, like, a dragon. So he's, like, a dragon telepathically controlling this armor he summons a big barrier so Ainz can't really leave or teleport and basically he's trying to kill all these npcs because they're we're like too overpowered in this world so yeah Ainz versus this big armor dude it's such a cool fight he, he has like 50 weapons surrounding him just like throwing shit at Ainz Ainz has like all his abilities he's overpowered as fuck he has his bone walls he has the body of effulgent berry lightning magic his magic cane that like he uses to create distance and he has his undead summon that are also kind of OD so it, it's getting nowhere and then Albedo finally comes in because the red dude finished distracting her yeah it's an insane fight we never saw Ainz really get tested too much uh one-on-one -on -one. also the funny thing is this wasn't Ainz it's Pandora's actor we got baited again so it, that's that's crazy like Ainz is big chilling in his throne wearing his golden drip jacket while Pandora's actor doing a good job. But yeah, overall good fight scene. We get introduced to like this dragon villain. And I wonder what's going to happen when we reach the finale. Are these people going to play a part? Or are they going to try to stop Heinz? Is Heinz really going to genocide a lot of innocent people? Well, we'll see. Okay, so for Call of the Night, episode 11. Another solid episode. Love watching this anime. We finally get some like world building, some consequences out here. Because we learn about other vampires. So the vampires aren't really waifu, nice girl people. There's also some evil ones that um would cause people to suffer. Cause yeah, before like before episode one, when you think of vampire, you're like, 
yeah, they're gonna bite me. They're gonna, you know, make me turn into a vampire. I can't live life back to normal. I'm gonna melt into sunlight, etc., etc. I'm gonna turn into a monster, basically. But then once you meet Nazina and all the other vampire girls, you're like, ah, oh, shit. Vampire waifus out here. Yes, please bite my neck, mommy. So, yeah, we always thought vampires were kind of chill in this anime. So, Ko, he's trying to find new customers for Nazuna since Nazuna got more money being a maid. So, she just upgraded her work setup. She got a comfortable bed. She got outfits. So, Ko's out here walking the streets at night trying to look for more customers. So, yeah, Ko finds a new waifu. What else is new? These are girls are attracted to him like magnets. And it's it's the best one yet. One of my favorites. Uh, she's wearing glasses, she's smoking, she's just sitting on a bridge. She's a private detective. Wow, that's kind of scary. And when, when I heard about this, I'm like, oh shit, are you like actually looking for Ko or something? Are you are you like a plant here? Maybe Ko's parents like told you to track him or something. So yeah, Ko meets with this private detective and they sit in a restaurant together. It's uh, very awkward because Ko is just like trying to explain the situation. Oh, you want to uh, come over and get a massage? And she's like, yes, yeah, this is a little sketchy. You're kind of like breaking the law, by the way, because you're a minor working at night. But we get the real juicy shit out here. So we find out that her name is Anko and basically she's working on a case. So she's looking for Akun. You remember him? I think the blonde girl Sari turned him into a vampire a few episodes ago. And then Ko, when he sees the picture, he flinches. He's like, uh, and then she, she just instantly grabs him. She takes that moment. Like she sees the fear in his eyes, his heartbeat. So she knows Ko is hiding something so sussy. So Anko, the detective is out here. Now Ko got to watch himself. Maybe she's going to follow him. So we'll kind of worry about that later. New wife detective just dropped but we still gotta do more slice of life things ko basically hangs out with his friends at school they don't really get the time to hang out with each other so they do the thing where like there's like seven haunted mysteries in school so to go investigate everything and it's just like a cool hangout session there's one more rumor in the school it's a ghost teacher that just randomly appears so maybe we'll investigate we'll go into the haunted classroom so they go in there they're like okay you know do it this ain't shit but the, there's the teacher actually exists. There's some like elderly teacher there. And then he kind of turns around. He's like, why are there students here at this time? I've tried holding myself back. I got shivers like what? Like, is this a normal dude cosplaying? No, it's an actual vampire. So it's like a male vampire we see. So Akun's not the first one. This dude is. The thing is, he hasn't ever drank blood. So when he sees these little kids, he's like, he's thirsty. So he actually ambushes Akira, kind of pins her down, starts drooling on her face. It was so creepy. I feel so bad for her. But yeah, like he kind of restrained himself. So yeah, who would have expected this like a vampire ghost actually existed? So Ko and Mahiro try to pull him off, but the vampire is too strong. So Ko kind of like smacks him in the head with the chair. Ko freezes a little bit because he knows that he's a vampire. So maybe Ko's like slowly changing into a vampire himself. Uh, well, we'll have to see about that. But yeah, basically poor Akira. We kind of like knocked the vampire out, but it's not over. They're just looking at the vampire kind of suffer. He's still like talking about his life story. Oh, this was I was like holding myself back for 10 years this is too hard why are there students at this hour Ko also like comments that all the vampires i've seen they were hot as fuck they were like handsome because this is a dude that turned into a vampire unwillingly he didn't want to be a vampire he was tricked and right there on Ko comes in <laughs> We meet the detective girl again. So basically she was trailing this vampire in the school. She kind of baits the vampire teacher to bite her neck. And then she kind of like holds it down a little and like comforts it. So yeah, the dude's going on town on her neck. She's bleeding a lot, but apparently her blood tastes bad. So like the dude kind of like collapses a bit. This is because yeah, he hasn't ate human blood in 10 years. He's never ate human blood. So we kind of see the dark side of vampires where if you turn into a vampire outside of your own will. So this dude just like was starving himself. He didn't want to be a real vampire and so here's the thing we get more vampire lore so we got the lore where it's one year for you to turn into a vampire for you to fall in love with the girl there's another one so 10 years you don't drink blood you die and there's also a way to kill vampires i guess it's like a mix of silver like silver kind of hurts them and then the sunlight also melts them at the same time but it seems like you need both of them combined. So Anko basically kills the vampire with silver and then like putting his body out in the sun. Ko is kind of like angry like, oh, why'd you let him die? What's wrong with you? And Anko's like, bruh, you know, it's not normal what you want. <laughs> like turning into a vampire, that ain't normal. So she kind of tells Ko to give up on his dream and then she's going to be watching him. And she also gives her card to the other two students. That's some juicy plot out here. So Nazuna, you know, cool, friendly vampire. But maybe some of these vampires are evil, not to be trusted. So who turned this teacher into a vampire? 
who tricked him i mean it could be anyone we met the whole squad of girls it could be them we know nazuna never like made any offspring herself so it's probably not her so now we got to see the consequences of this if there's any fallout and i guess we got to wait to see if like kowal changes his mind about his dream but probably not and yeah that's it for call of the night but yeah pretty intense episode i love the new waifu we got her voice acting was very nice it just emulated the voice of like someone that's very tired but also very sharp and witty and I hope we see more of her as we're kind of finishing up with this anime very soon. Okay, so for Made in Abyss Season 2. So this was a pretty cool episode. Just like, you know, some stuff happened. A lot of, like, brutality. Last episode, it was a fight between Fapita and Reg. And basically, Fapita got the upper hand on Reg until we reached the end credits. So yeah, what happens? Yeah, Fapita beat Reg. So Reg was, like, on top of her. They kind of cried, like, oh, why'd it have to be like this? And then Fapita kind of, like, countered. And then she, like, took a bite out of Reg's head. <laughs> and now Reg's injured. He's not dead, but... Yeah. Yeah, like, Nefapita's like, get out of here, Reg, Rico. Let me, like, continue my mission on killing everyone. So Fapita's out here on her genocide mission. But, you know, things take a turn, actually. So we see Beloff, the big white snake monster. So we, I thought he disappeared last time, but no, this is kind of, like, his last wish. So basically, he visits Fapita, kind of, like, implants all these memories. It's kind of, like, his magic smoke power as he disintegrates. And now Fapita remembers everything that happened to her mother. She sees her and Vueco hang out. She sees, like, all the stuff happening happening with the village everyone's taking care of her it was all happy before everyone got sick so if Apata kind of cries she kind of just appreciates the life around her and she's like confused like oh my mission is to kill everyone but now like these people were kind of happy back then so like what do I do well before she can think of her emotions before she could kill more people or do something just a whole squad of monsters come in it's not one or two monsters, it's just like a whole bunch of different races of huge, like, rhinos, bees, pterodactyls, dinosaurs. <laughs> and, bro, they're so savage. Like, these abyss monsters, there's not one or two of them, it's a whole army. They start attacking all the villagers, just eating them, ravaging them. There's nothing we can do, like, holy shit. Papata also, like, tries to fight them off, because she's like, Bro, this is my prey. How dare you try to, like, interfere in my village. But then they, they kind of, like, fight Papata as well, they kind of keep biting her. Like, they bite her hands off, her eyes, she's just so injured. She can regen and heal. The issue is she can't heal fast enough. And then the big dragon comes in, the giraffe-looking motherfucker that can shoot fire bombs. He's the most dangerous one ever. He just comes in looking like a king. So his whole village is basically wrecked, and this is what I'm expecting in the abyss anyway. Like, how can anyone survive here? Just, like, too much wildlife, too many monsters aggroing, and then the village is out of protection, so everyone's dying. But then there's like a cool Spider-Man moment as everyone kind of surrounds Fapita, all the villagers, while she's super injured. And they give part of their body parts to feed her, to heal her. So it's like, Fapita, I know you like hate the village, but we want to protect you. We love you. And now she's healing with the body parts of the villagers. So like, it's like part of her mother. And yeah, Fapita's healing power, she's like basically immortal, but now she's like growing even stronger. Also, the big dinosaur monster attacked her robot friend. <laughs> so the robot friend died, rest in peace to him. She turns into like this like big fox monster looking like nine tails from Pokemon. She has like big white fur, looks so much bigger and stronger. And I guess all these monsters better watch out because Fapita got a big upgrade. And we end the episode there, so yeah, cool episode. Nothing gets resolved just yet, so we just gotta wait for this fight to kind of continue. I don't really see her living past this season, but if she does, that, that like that would be pretty solid. So yeah, that's it for Made in Abyss this week. And now for Licorice Recoil episode 12. So I thought this would be the finale. I matched my surprise when this was actually not the finale. Bro, we got more to go. And then yeah, there's one more episode left. 13 episodes. They really baited us out here with these 12 episode shows being 13. But basically things resolved pretty well. So Majima got destroyed because he can't take on the tag team of Chisato and Takina. Chisato just shooting him while he's distracted. Takina being there, kind of tying him up and stuff. So Majima's really strong though. He's like, you know, hand to hand really good. He can like slip through the shadows. But then Chisato, she like shoots her gun next to his ear. That just destroys on him so much and she does it again to both ears so yeah he's basically stunned and then he gets tied up they don't really kill him because yeah we can't really kill people now that's Trisato's mission don't kill anyone which is kind of sad because you know don't kill the villain that might come back to bite you after that there's some emotional moments happening 
where Yoshimatsu, she Sato finally meets him in the upper level of the tower. Thing is, he's like the evil dad character. <laughs> he has no love for Chisato. He only sees her as a weapon. Chisato's kind of in denial, like, I looked up to you, and it, this is what's happening. He actually wanted her to kill Majima and everything, and then he has, like, a gun with actual live bullets. So then, yeah, he's, like, being so evil, so Takina comes in just in time, and then she, like, gives us a big plot dump just to, like, convince Chisato to kill him. So basically, Yoshimatsu is the huge villain. He spread all, he, like, he worked with Majima, he spread out all the guns, he's like playing all sides, and then he's the one who actually broke Chisato's heart. We don't forget about that. So yeah, he did all of this for I don't know what reason, but I guess he wants revenge on Chisato because she's just doing more slice of life cafe things when he actually wants her to murder people. We also see that the second artificial heart that he has, he has it implanted in his own heart. So that one I'm kind of confused about because why would you do that? Like, is did you have heart problems yourself, bro? So that kind of sucks because Chisato has the two month to live deadline. So if Yoshimatsu has the heart, then Chisato can't live. So Yoshimatsu was like, Chisato, kill me. That's the only way. And Chisato, she's not gonna pull the trigger, no way. So then, yeah, they start fighting because Takino actually wants to shoot Yoshimatsu, but then Chisato kind of blocks her. And then the new waifu comes in, like the nurse waifu. Takino kind of like falls outside of the building. The issue is Yoshimatsu starts firing from above the tower. So then Chisato just shoots him in the hip. So the bullet went through him and then he didn't really get a shot in any vital organs. So he won't die. And I guess Chisato lets him escape, which is kind of weird. Cause like, shouldn't you arrest them or something? It was a bit anticlimactic, but yeah, I guess she doesn't want Takina to murder them. Cause Takina is like out there shooting bullets straight up. But yeah, we kind of forget about that because the helicopter comes in and they have a request to save the licorice because the licorice since their identity got revealed they're being killed by the lily bell so lily bell we saw earlier i guess mentioned it's basically the male licorice group so then it's up to chisato and takina to save everyone so they go in uh, with the help of walnut the hacker girl and they kind of like control the building they block out a lot of the doors so most of the licorice are like out safely and then when chisato shows up the lily bell are like yeah yeah okay we can't do this anymore they had like a backup video that was kind of like oh this is like an advertisement the licorice aren't real it's just a joke so that's fine no one really died this episode we get introduced to the lily bell where like the male licorice so i don't know why the government are creating these high school kids to become like murder assassins but i guess the concept is pretty funny after that though we get the end of the episode where machima is still alive so while the licorice are retreating it's all good shisato kind of like exits the elevator while everyone's going down Majima's there, he's, he's shooting his machine gun at everyone. They kind of have a blast shield to kind of block everything, but then Chisato is left in the same level as Majima. They kind of smile at each other. I don't know if they're going to fight or if they're going to like talk, maybe work it out. But yeah, basically a lot of character development for some licorice characters here. Chisato, they really wanted her to kill someone. She didn't pull the trigger. Majima is still an issue. I wonder how we're going to deal with him, but one more episode left to go. I cannot wait. Okay, so for Shadow's House Season 2, Episode 11, another good episode. We get some backstories, explanations, more lore of the house as we're kind of finishing up very soon. I really love this episode. It was something I was expecting earlier since in the OP we saw Barbie featured a lot. So I thought we would get Barbie backstory. We finally get it here, 11 episodes in of the season. But yeah, it starts off with Mary Rose being like kind of taken to the grandfather's wing because that's where she's going to get her punishment since she was imprisoned. Kate kind of turned her in to like kind of save her name. And yeah, basically it's kind of sad because, you know, we're going to see her maybe get executed or something. So basically they go to the grandfather's wing. Oh, the only way towards it is through like this giant hallway between the child and adult rooms. Mary Rose and Rosemary aren't really faced too much. They're like, okay, it is what it is. But as they're walking, as they get escorted, everyone's kind of watching behind them. And Mary Rose kind of like mentions a promise that Barbie made back in the day. Because they were like part of like the same class. So here we kind of learn about Christopher. He's like this like cool, handsome dude. And then his doll was like really solid, really smart. And then he was like kind of like a good doll where he like kind of prioritized education and everything. So we should teach all the dolls. It shouldn't be like a superiority contest. Everyone should have like an equal fair share. So he kind of like introduces a teaching system where like star bearers like help teach the new coming dolls. And then yeah, everyone's down with the idea. Barbie's there, like she loves it. We see them when they're young. They're like really positive and nice. We also see Edward there when he was a kid, just like being all edgy and superior to everyone. So yeah, I hate that dude, Edward. 
He's always been evil. But it's really nice seeing Barbie and everyone being so happy before the incident occurs. So yeah, everyone's training, you know, living their life. Mary Rose realizes that the shadow coffee is like evil, so she doesn't really drink it. And she convinces a lot of other people not to drink it. So they're kind of like in a better mindset to think. But then when Christopher became an adult, that's when shit went wrong. Mary Rose locked herself in her room. Barbie's confused, like Barbara, like no one's talking to her anymore. So this happy kind of moment where everyone was teachers hanging out, it ended when Christopher became an adult. So what happened? Well, it's revealed that Christopher killed himself because he found out the doll shadow process, it involves fusion and he didn't want to kill his human. So he's like, yeah, I'm out. So the shadow actually killed himself and the doll is alive. That's that's insane. And I think we saw that Christopher's doll also died. So yeah, nothing's good. Also, we learn about what happened to Barbara, why she's still a star bearer and not an adult. Because she activated her power when she got like really stressed with everyone was like leaving her alone. So then she kind of like exploded a bit and Barbie was right next to her. So Barbie kind of like hit her head. She started bleeding a lot in her forehead and they went to the grandfather's wing. Grandfather was like, you damaged your doll's head. You cannot be an adult. So, you know, keeping the human's head, like, perfect, I, I don't know why that's, like, a big deal. But the fact that Barbie has one scar on her forehead, we can't even see it because her bangs are so long. She cannot be an adult. And then the grandfather also tells her, okay, since you're not an adult, you're just going to be a star bearer. And then you're just going to be working there managing the kids until the doll's face is healed. Who knows how long that'll be. So that's why Barbie's, like, so evil now. So she has like no goal anymore. All her friends are like gone. They ghosted her. She's injured. It's just not happy anymore. Her doll's like super powered now and is like also suffering. So life is tough out here. They also know about the fusion process. So like a good amount of people know that the doll and the human merge together. And so as we get that flashback, all that backstory, we kind of go back into the present time. They're following Edward. They're getting escorted into the adult wing, but they have a backup plan. Rosemary, Mary Rose, they summon a sudden monster. It's a huge one that just breaks the bridge. And then Edward, he like shows up his shadow power. He has like soot that can like ring in your ears so he can like vibrate the air and it just like, you know, stuns you because you can't hear. So Mary Rose gets weaker. Her scorch kind of like evaporates and it's looking bad as they get cornered. The thing is behind them, there's a big shattered window. So yeah, they're smiling at each other. Like we're not going with you. We're not fusing and they fall down commit suicide as they hug themselves. I don't know if they like fell on the ground because it looked like there's like water underneath them, maybe hoping. So hopefully they don't die, but there's a high chance they did die. So then yeah, it's like more depressing stuff though because it's your only way out to not be an adult in the shadow's house to just commit suicide. No way, we gotta find a way to escape. But yeah, we learn a good amount. Mary Rose, Rosemary story, Barbara story. We learn about Christopher now, why his name is Taboo. And we see the grandfather again for the first time in this season. And I'm curious how they're gonna wrap this up. But yeah, that's it for Shadow's House this week. Okay, so for Ruby Ice Queendom episode 12, this is the finale. We're finally finished. It, it was good, I love the ending. A lot of things in this anime, music, action, they were like really solid. So that's like good pluses for Ruby. One issue is the story. The story wasn't bad, just like the direction they took was a little... They spent like eight episodes just in, inside this dream sequence. So I thought that just dragged on way too much. So yeah, we're basically fighting Weiss. That was, she's like the main boss villain in this anime. So yeah, when you think Ruby, you don't think Weiss is the villain. You think of like, you know, White Fang. You think of like the evil Grimm. You think of Amber. But yeah, we, we saw none of that here. But they are setting up some of the characters. So we saw them earlier. We saw the robot girl Penny kind of feature in a few episodes. So she was actually pretty significant sometimes. But overall, we beat Weiss. We saved her from this like dream Grimm. And also, Blake also got infected, so we also saved her at the same time. It, it kind of started off with Ruby going into the dream herself to save Weiss. She realized that she couldn't do it on her own. Weiss was too strong. She failed the first time. You should count how many times they failed. She comes in with Yang and Blake. They also fail the second time. They ran out of coins. They couldn't break out Weiss out of it. So they go in a third time. And now they have John accompanying them, since like John has experience with this. And then they fail again. <laughs> So they failed four times, it looks like. So the fifth time is the charm. They actually go in, they have like a plan, everyone splits up, they know the lay of the land. They're able to snipe Weiss out of it, but in consequence, Blake actually absorbed the power of the Grimm, just to kind of like fight toe-to-toe -to -toe with Weiss. And then Weiss sees something is wrong with Blake. What's wrong with you? I never wanted to hurt the Faunus. I was trying to work for equality, 
Blake is like, no, that, that's what your people always say. But it, it doesn't work out like that. So Ruby helps Weiss get free of the demon. Yang also punches Blake in the face and her mask. And now everything's back to normal. We solved the problems. So in this episode, people are just like chilling, just like a kind of like cool wrap up episode. Everyone's talking, reflecting on what happened. Everyone hanging out at school, Yang doing Yang things, Blake writing. Weiss kind of growing closer to her teammates. So it's like really cool. Oz Pen kind of talks to Ruby and Blake separately about like what happened. So he's like to Ruby, oh, are you sure you're not fit to be leader anymore? Ruby's like, I'm, I'm going to keep trying my best. And Blake, he he's like, it's kind of sussy how you knew like where the train robbers were coming from. So, you know, is there something you got to tell me? So, yeah, we know Blake is part of the White Fang. Uh, she's keeping a secret. I'm not sure if this was like a big plot point in the original, like Ruby, because she doesn't want to get expelled or anything. But I don't know, because it feels like Ozpen is like really forgiving. But yeah, he invites Blake to like kind of improve the human faunus relationship, stuff like that. But yeah, overall, we're all friends. Weiss and Blake are like getting along. They hang out, eat food, take selfies, talk to everyone. We see John actually training with Pira too. So yeah, John has some semblance. He's, he's trying to awaken it. Pira's helping him. And Pira's still out here alive and kicking. So we definitely got to see what's going to happen in future seasons. But there's a cool wrap up. In the end of the episode, there's uh, something I didn't expect. It's the Ruby food fight. They animated it. I thought they forgot about it, but it's here. We wrap up the thing. It's like the last day of vacation. Ruby's finding ideas on how to have fun. Everyone just like, you know, doesn't really care too much. And then they start like eating food at each other. And now it's an official food fight. And they have like all the watermelons, Yang with the chicken hands. And we ended off there. A common theme, just friendship and having fun. So yeah, I had mixed feelings on this anime. Really like the beginning. The first three episodes they dropped were like really solid, cool action. And then after that, the dream sequence stuff was like it dragged on extremely long. So I wouldn't really recommend this anime too much. If you're not familiar with Ruby at all, you'd probably enjoy the anime because you're going to be like, oh shit, the story is totally new. I love these characters, these girls fighting. So yeah, there's a lot of personality. The characters are basically the same as the original Ruby. They didn't really change the characters. It's just like the story. So yeah, the anime's over. Um, I mean, really enjoyed the Ruby anime. It's like very surprising that it released. And maybe there's a season two coming up, but we'll have to see. And now for Rent a Girlfriend, season two, episode 12. This is the finale. We finished season two, hooray. I did not like this season too much. <laughs> it wasn't really any big moments that made you go, oh shit. Like, it, it didn't really feel like a transition season either. It just felt like this, this was just boring. Like, we had to go through the slog. It didn't really reach the same level as season one, where there was, like, some good dramatic moments and some, like, cool plot twists that you didn't expect. Here, nothing really big happened besides Ruka's kiss. Yeah, Ruka did a lot in this season. Basically, she, you know, had a sleepover with Kazuya. She met out with him in the parents' house. She's like, I will not lose, but she's Chizuru is always number one out here. So yeah, things are getting kind of desperate in this last episode because, yeah, we learned that Chizuru's grandmother, she doesn't have too much time to live. And Chizuru, she wants to fulfill her dream before her grandmother dies. So we also get Chizuru backstory again. Uh, this was like pretty cool pretty cute so we see kid chizuru from like middle school she's like kind of like a delinquent she like gets into fights a lot and her grandfather's like oh why are you in another fight again they said the kids bullied me they said i don't have parents <laughs> damn these kids are savage and the grandfather's like what Yo, tell him your grandfather's out here. He's stronger than all their dads. So yeah, Cheezer's grandfather's really cool. He kind of reminds me of Kasia. I guess that's the kind of the vibe they're going for. And then Cheezer, she liked reading books and watching movies and stuff. And then one day, she saw her grandmother was like part of this movie. So she realizes her grandmother is an actress and that inspires Cheezer to be an actress. She makes that her dream and her grandfather like supports her all the way. He's like, dreams always come true. Believe in yourself. The issue comes when her grandfather gets hit by a car. So yeah, I shouldn't be laughing because that's kind of sad. And it's like a big turning point. Chizuru gets like a bit dramatic. She's like remembers the time her grandfather told her to climb the stairs of a shrine a hundred times. Chizuru goes and climbs the stairs of the shrine. She gets all dirty, gets all tired, comes back in the hospital. Everyone's crying. The grandfather, he's alive. But then the grandfather kind of wakes up a bit. He says, like, his last words. I think he said, like, oh, dreams really do come true, but then he actually dies. <laughs> so it's very sad. Yeah, so after that, we kind of see what Chizuru is going through. Like, she really wants to be an actress, but it's, like, so hard. You gotta be lucky. So Chizuru is working all these gigs, being a rental girlfriend, to, like, kind of work on her acting skills. But it's still, like, a long way for her to achieve her dream. That is until Kazuya comes in. He knocks on her door. Chizuru is like, oh, it's a, it's a bad time. Kazuya kind of barges in, like, bruh, <laughs> we gotta talk. And then he's like, I'll help you make a movie. Sumi told me about crowdfunding. <laughs> Kazuya does some quick Googling and he realizes that they can crowdfund a movie. 
basically they could like you know get enough budget write a script do everything have chizuru be the main actress and her dream will be fulfilled she'll be a successful actress in front of her grandmother so that's where we end the season it's a very heartwarming moment because we get a new goal to like kind of look forward to chizuru is finally going to be an actress kazuya is actually supporting her so there it, this is like a good moment for them to be closer together we get the classic end of season wrap up with everyone so we see kazuya studying a lot like learning about like crowdfunding tips to kind of help out chizuru we see ruko just like wanting to get closer to kazuya we see kazuya's friends out here so it's all of the same i think the biggest one we see is mommy at the end she kind of gets the address of kazuya's family business so mommy she's playing dirty what's she gonna do <laughs> she even says do i have no life as she's like stalking kazuya's family so we end the anime there pretty solid we just gotta achieve chizuru's dreams her last word she called kazuya baka as she's like in the shower thinking about how they're gonna make the movie together so it's like come on guys it's only a matter of time before they ask each other out but again this manga series is ongoing there's no winner as of now so yeah we just gotta keep watching there's a season three confirmed so you know get hype but that's it for Rent a Girlfriend this season. If you're looking for trash romance shows, yeah, you really need to follow this one. And that is it for week 11. Thank you for watching. Hopefully, I did these animes justice. Also, yeah, check out Cyberpunk Edge Runners if you have the time. It's another cool anime that drops, so you could binge it anytime. And yeah, I'm definitely excited to get the finales for most of these shows. Next week and the week after that, it's gonna be over as we get prepared for the fall season.